This right? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, we all here? You good? Okay, I don't have a gavel, so I'm using a pencil. Uh, the Rules Committee will come to order. Uh, uh, first of all, um, I think one of the first action, actions of business is, is we're going we're gonna to pass a rule to take over the Ways and Means Committee and make this the Rules Committee meeting room. But uh, first, let me say that I appreciate, uh, I want to say this at the beginning here, that I appreciate the flexibility of our ranking member, Mr. Cole, as the agenda tonight came together. Uh, I've been incredibly proud of how we've worked together here in this Congress. We've examined a lot of things in the committee, and no matter how politically divisive the topic, we have done so in a thoughtful and constructive way. And I look forward to working with uh, you, Mr. Cole, uh, on, a, on the bipartisan effort that was announced today that will examine how Congress could better adapt to the emergencies like the coronavirus pandemic. I know we both care deeply about this institution. One way or another, Congress is going to have to adapt to whatever the future may bring. The head of the CDC has said uh, that this fall could be worse than what we're going through right now. I hope and I pray that he is wrong. But we need to be prepared, uh, and that may mean uh, working remotely. I've always uh, said that changes to the way we operate should be done whenever possible in a bipartisan and collaborative way, and I'm hopeful that we can get there together. But I really believe that inaction um, uh, or maintaining the status quo is not an option. Now let me turn to the matter at hand. Uh, tonight we are considering a measure to stand uh, up the House Select Committee on the Coronavirus Crisis. The impacts of the pandemic have been staggering. In the U.S. alone, there have been over 840,000 confirmed cases, and as we speak, more than 45,000 lives lost, and more than 22 million initial unemployment claims in just the past four weeks. Some regions of our country have now lost as many jobs over the last month as they did during the worst year of the Great Recession. These statistics aren't just numbers on a page. This virus has touched every community in the nation impacting our neighbors, our family, and our friends. Congress has responded swiftly and provided over $2 trillion in emergency relief. We need to make sure that these tax dollars are being well spent. That means saving lives, rooting out fraud, and fighting for all our small businesses. And that is just what this select committee will do. But before I turn to our ranking member, I also want to thank Congressman Doris Matsui, for joining this committee temporarily as our good friend, uh, Congressman Mark DeSaunier, continues his recovery. I know all of us are glad to hear that Mark is continuing to make progress, uh, and we hear from his staff that he is anxious to get out of the hospital. I look forward to welcoming him back here uh, just as soon as he is able. As all of you may know, Congresswoman Matsui has served on this committee previously, including in the opening days of this Congress and her insight and leadership will be invaluable as we continue our work. And so having said that, I'm now happy to turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you. Let me start with a couple of personal remarks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, uh, join you, obviously, in uh, sending our best wishes to our good friend, Mr. Desanye, and uh, we hope he's back. We're extraordinarily pleased with the replacement that was chosen, of course. 
but uh, we all want uh, Mark back and, and working with us. He's a valuable member and a, and a very good friend to everybody here. And I want to also thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind words. And uh, we don't always agree on every issue. It's sort of the nature of this business, but uh, you've been uh, forthright and communicative, and uh, I appreciate the manner in which you've uh, worked with us and included us in a very difficult time as as we've seen changing decisions and had to adjust as a committee. And uh, I applaud your leadership, appreciate your friendship. With that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, today's hearing is on Speaker Pelosi's proposed select committee on the coronavirus pandemic. Earlier this month, Speaker Pelosi announced that she would create such a select committee, uh, conveniently ignoring that any such select committee has to be established through the Rules Committee. Today, the Rules Committee is being asked to essentially retroactively rubber stamp her action. This is particularly egregious considering that up until an hour ago uh, or so, we had absolutely no details. Uh, the Speaker gave our side no notice of her plans, no indication of her rationale or vision, and has frankly been radio silent since her announcement except for an occasional media mention. This is not the way to operate on something that uh, she purports to want to do in a bipartisan fashion. I will also say, Mr. Chairman, that I'm not sure what the goal of such a committee will be. The Speaker claims that the Select Committee will examine all aspects of the federal response to the coronavirus pandemic and will provide oversight for federal dollars being spent on the response. But Congress already has significant oversight tools at our disposal. The CARES Act established a five-member Congressional Oversight Commission specifically for this purpose. I note that my uh, good friend from Florida, Representative Shalala, is the House Majority's designee for one of the five seats uh, on that commission. This commission is in addition to Congress's other oversight tools, which include the House Committee on Oversight and Reform and the oversight subcommittees that exist on most other permanent House committees. If we already have a separate oversight commission specifically for the CARES Act, and we already have a separate oversight and reform committee, and we already have separate oversight committees, what then is the actual purpose of the proposed committee? My fear, Mr. Chairman, is that this new select committee will simply turn into another partisan witch hunt into the Trump administration. I hope I'm wrong. Either way, I can think of better uses of our time and our resources, Mr. Chairman, given how much oversight already exists over funds appropriated in the CARES Act. There may be a time in the future when it makes sense to establish a commission like the 9-11 Commission to review the COVID-19 pandemic and the government response. But such a commission needs to be bipartisan and devoted to what happened, when it happened, and what we can learn uh, from it to improve government responses in the future. This partisan select committee does not meet that test. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I neglected at the beginning to, uh, to mention that Dr. Monaghan, the attending physician, was, uh, was present in the audience here today. But uh, still here. he's still, we're, we're, there, there, there he is. Yeah. And, Father uh, and, and Father Conroy is here as well. Um, so we feel, I feel that we're especially protected here. Um, but, uh, but I just wanted to read some instructions uh, that the attending physician uh, suggested that we follow as guidelines. Um, always use a face covering even when you are speaking. Avoid congregating in groups. Stay six feet apart. Use hand sanitizer. Don't shake hands or embrace folks. Uh, and when exiting the room, respect social distancing guidelines. Um, and so I, um, I, I point that out because uh, we all have to get used to uh, kind of the uh, new instructions here, and I think it's important not just for the safety of members, but especially for the safety of staff and press and uh, the, uh, the stenographers and others who are here uh, supporting us. Um, uh, so um, uh, I want to thank the ranking member for his comments. Um, are there any members wishing to testify on this measure? I see one, uh, Mr. Jordan. You may take your seat at the, I don't know, this is new to me. Where's, where's, I guess in the middle there. Mr. Jordan, we're delighted that you are here. Anything you brought in writing will, without objection, be entered into the record. I now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, you and the ranking member <coughs> and your entire uh, committee for being here. I think it um, just sends a good signal to the American people that Congress is back doing, um, 
doing their, their business. You know, we got all kinds of task force uh, meeting the White House around the country in various states, but it seems to me the task force that is supposed to address big issues that confront our nation is the United States Congress. And so it's good to see, um, good to see the, the committee process uh, back and functioning uh, 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 this evening. So I, I'm, I'm strongly opposed to this uh, select committee, um, Mr. Chairman. There are currently, to pick up where the ranking member just was, eight different oversight processes in place as we speak. First, as the ranking member mentioned, you got the oversight committee, who's, who's got the broadest jurisdiction of any committee in Congress they can look at. In fact, this, this legislation, which we just got to read 15 minutes ago, uh, actually creates the select committee within the jurisdiction of the oversight committee. So you have the oversight committee one. Second, as the ranking member also mentioned, you got the committees of jurisdiction, the various subcommittees who do oversight on those committees, the Ways and Means Committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, the Small Business Committee, and of course the Financial Services Committee. Third, again as the ranking member mentioned, the CARES Act itself creates a commission, an oversight commission. Two of our colleagues have already been named to that, Congressman Shalala and Congressman Hill. Fourth, in the CARES Act, you have the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee within the councils of inspector generals. So a fourth oversight process currently in place. Fifth, the inspector generals from the relevant agencies have jurisdiction here. We already know they're operating. Treasury Inspector General, Health and Human Services. In fact, the Health and Human Services has already released reports about the pandemic response effort that's out there. Sixth. The CARES Act established a special inspector general. Seventh, $20 million was appropriated in the CARES Act to GAO for hiring auditors and experts to look at how the money's been spent. And finally, eighth, you have the FTC, the Department of Justice, who were already looking at potential, in fact, we got a briefing today from the FTC, the Judiciary Committee did, on the fraud they've already They've already found people trying to, to fraudulently get access to taxpayer money that's designed to help families and small business owners. Eight different oversight processes in place as we speak, but the Democrats said, nope, that's not enough. That's not enough. We need a ninth. We need a ninth. Why? The first eight aren't good enough. We need a ninth. And I think the answer is exactly what the ranking member said. The first eight are designed to protect taxpayer dollars. The ninth is political. The first eight are going to look out for the taxpayers. The ninth is going to look out for the Democrats' candidate for president, Joe Biden. Because who did the speaker announce is going to be the chairman? The biggest supporter of the president. The guy who won the nomination for Joe Biden in South Carolina, our colleague, Mr. Clyburn. That's what this is about. And it is, as the ranking member mentioned as well, this is just one more attempt by the Democrats to go after the president. One more chance for them to, one more chance for them to attack the president in an election year and put the biggest supporter of the Democrats nominee as the chairman of this select committee when we already have eight different oversight processes in place doing the work for the American taxpayer. But that's consistent with where the Democrats have been this entire Congress. Remember, their first big hearing was Michael Cohen. Then we had the whole Trump-Russia investigation. Then we had the Mueller investigation. Then we had the impeachment. And now here we go in an election year in the summer. We know what these hearings will look like this fall. Probably take place in this room. All the big hearings seem to do. Probably take place in this room. And they'll be calling in all kinds of people to go after the president. So I strongly oppose. I'm with the ranking member. I strongly oppose this legislation. Hope that it doesn't go to the floor tomorrow and hope that it doesn't pass. With that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak today and I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and the gentleman you know, mentioned the Inspector General uh, uh, as a way for us to keep an account of what's going on here. If I remember correctly, the President in his signing statement basically said he wasn't going to allow the Inspector General to report to Congress. But let me just say this. Uh, we're talking about $2 trillion, $2 trillion. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 th and I think we are already getting questions from our constituents as, as to whether or not it's being uh, administered properly uh, as to whether or not it's going to where it's supposed to go. I mean, I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, that there are people out there, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, who are going to have a hard time understanding the importance of making sure that we get this right. Um, and um, I think every member of this institution, both Democrats and Republicans, 
has an interest in making sure that uh, this critical life-saving money that we have appropriated is being administered properly and being spent effectively and it will do the, where it will do the most good. So I thank the gentleman. I yield to the, my colleague from uh, Oklahoma, Mr. Cole, for any questions or comments he has. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I know it's new technology yeah. here. New, yeah. new technology. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, look, I don't have any questions for my friend because I agree, frankly, with what he had to say. Uh, and uh, for the life of me, I just can't understand why eight exist or six existing committees, multiple subcommittees, uh, can't do this task. Uh, that's their job. They do it well. Uh, my friends actually control all of those committees. So the need for this strikes me as extraordinarily superfluous. And I see more opportunities for mischief here than I do for legitimate oversight. Uh, and I, I have a hard time, again, understanding why we don't trust our colleagues whose responsibility this is and who engage in it routinely uh, on a whole variety of fronts. So, uh, again, no, uh, no questions for my friend. I just want to express my appreciation for him showing up and appearing and making the points he did. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Torres. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The only thing you have to fear is fear itself. Because if the fear is strong enough, it can immobilize you and leave you paralyzed. Some people say that fear is the strongest emotion. And because of this, FDR said this in 1933. And he was talking about the economic depression. Depressions get worse if people are afraid to spend their money or invest, such is the savings paradox of economic theory. I think what the fear in oversight here really means is that we don't care who has access to this money because we've seen it in the last bill, who got access to the money that was intended for the poor working business community the poor working small businesses that were robbed of their opportunity to do right by their employees. They were robbed because of greed, tremendous greed, on behalf of banks who stood to benefit bigger bonuses if they fast-tracked the bigger payouts so they left the little guy behind. But my personal interest is not necessarily just an oversight of how we direct money or how banks choose to steal the money or how greed could impact the rich. I am also interested in seeing how local governments spend our hard-earned taxpayers' dollars. We've all seen it. Public corruption. It corrupts every level of government. I'm interested in seeing and having oversight on how some hotels, like a hotel at the Fairplex in my hometown of Pomona, the only five-star hotel in my city, could be turned into a COVID hotel to host the most vulnerable people. This was five days after the state and the county were looking to send these poor homeless people to a dilapidated building adjacent to the police and fire station near our courthouses. I'm interested in oversight on every single penny that we spent. Unlike many of you, I sent my IRS payment prior to April 15th. And by the way, it was cash four days later. I only wish that 
my constituents who are hurting right now were able to get a return on their loan request within four days. So I support this measure. I support having more oversight. Oversight is good. And you should not fear oversight. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Woodall. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I want to say to Mr. Jordan's uh, point about how good it is to, to see folks uh, uh, here in the, uh, in the hearing room. Uh, uh, thank you for, even while we have been out, uh, continuing to convene us and, uh, and, and uh, engage on those issues, such as uh, continuity of, of Congress. Uh, even as the, as the doors may have been closed, uh, folks' uh, uh, minds were still focused on the, on the problems at hand. I want to tell you how much uh, well, I appreciate that. I actually missed you, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> well, to, to, uh, to Mr. Jordan's uh, uh, point, I, I do think we, we uh, perform better uh, together. I think everybody has something uh, to add. It pains me in particular to see Mr. Morelli on the bottom dais of the Rules Committee because he's a top dais member, as is uh, uh, Dr. Shalala and, and Ms. Matsui at this, at the downside of this, uh, uh, this larger room. But this is a matter of, of, of Rules Committee original jurisdiction. Mr. Jordan, I, I don't want to put you on the on the spot because we just saw this language uh, an hour ago, and so I know you just saw this language an hour ago, but you're the best that we have in terms of, of an oversight committee uh, expert. Could I ask you, I, I've, I've only served one term on the oversight committee. How many, how many years have, uh, did, did you serve on the oversight committee? Five terms now, Five or terms. six terms, part, part of the first one, yeah. The, Actually longer, I was, I was, I don't know, it's almost the whole time I've been here. Thank you, Mr. Woodall. <laughs> To uh, Ms. Torres's point, I do think that uh, uh, fraudulent actors go to where the money is, and this is where the money is uh, right now. So I absolutely think that we have to uh, 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 redouble our efforts to make sure that, that these dollars aren't, uh, aren't wasted. Um, I'm looking at what the select subcommittee is authorized uh, to do. Uh, I could not find anything in its list of, 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 uh, of mandates that I did not think the Oversight Committee already had the ability uh, to do, and I wanted to ask you about a, a couple of those. The, mm -hmm. the, the committee is authorized uh, to uh, investigate the efficiency, effectiveness, the equity and transparency of the use of taxpayer funds and relief programs to address the coronavirus. Would that be in the Oversight Committee's jurisdiction already? It sure would, and it would also be in the, the seven other entities that, that I referenced in my opening statement. They, it is authorized to investigate reports of waste, fraud, abuse, price gouging, profiteering, and other abusive practices related to the coronavirus. Would that be in the Oversight Committee's jurisdiction already? Sure would, and same answer. The uh, implementation or effectiveness of any federal law applied, enacted, or under consideration to address the coronavirus uh, crisis, would that same, also? Same answer. Uh, preparedness for and response to the coronavirus crisis, including the planning for and implementation of testing, containment, mitigation, and surveillance activities? Same answer. The, uh, I, I can uh, go on. There, there are four, uh, uh, five, six more uh, uh, items here, concluding with and any other issues related to the coronavirus uh, crisis, given your five terms on the committee, can you anticipate, again, an extraordinary new program and that the programs that we've set up in response to the coronavirus, uh, a pandemic as we have never seen in our lifetimes, do you see gaps in the Oversight Committee's jurisdiction that do need to be plugged, even no. if this language does not plug them? No, we, we have the complete authority, as I said in my, my opening statement, the Oversight Committee has the broadest jurisdiction of any committee in Congress. We should look into all this. Uh, we can look into all this. We should look into all these, uh, this con these concerns as, as they come up. Uh, that, is, that is our job, uh, and, and as well as the seven other entities that I talked about, the eight entities who are already doing the work for the taxpayers, but somehow the Democrats think we need a ninth. And it seems to me the ninth is to do the work for Joe Biden, it's political in nature, versus the eight that are supposed to be working for the American taxpayers. And that, that's, the big, that's the big distinction I see. The uh, uh, section uh, uh, 3C uh, says the select subcommittee may not hold a markup of legislation. Uh, I don't serve on any committees or subcommittees that don't mark up legislations. We're legislators, so we legislate. Is that something that uh, is, is common in the, in the oversight committee that, that folks investigate uh, but have no ability uh, no. to legislate? No, we, we do both. They, I don't know who the 
I don't know who the author of that language is. Again, we're the committee of, of original jurisdiction here, and, and you're the only witness we've had come to testify, so I don't, I don't mean to, to put you on the spot. Um, it says uh, here, Section uh, 2B, each member appointed to the select subcommittee shall be treated as though they are a member of the Committee on Oversight and Reform for purposes of the select subcommittee. Uh, will this subcommittee be comprised of members of the Oversight Committee, or is there some sort of, 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 of special status member that serves on this subcommittee but doesn't serve on the Oversight Committee? Well, I, I guess the, the short answer is I don't know. I don't know that, I, that any of us know, uh, but the answer is probably not, or, or probably will be people on the Select Committee who are not part of the Oversight Committee, because I think the Speaker of the House has already announced who the Chairman is, and I've referenced our colleague, Mr. Clyburn, a couple times. So. Um, we don't know for sure because we, we, we don't know who's been appointed yet, but based on what the Speaker of the House has said several times publicly in the media, it looks like it's going to be someone who's not currently on the Oversight Committee. Now, will they be on the Oversight Committee when they're, when they're named by the Speaker? I, I guess, but I don't know how that, that actually functions. The, thinking about the, the breadth of the task of doing oversight, again, over an extraordinary amount of money going out the, the door, um, it... Uh, References here in the bill that, that members of this uh, committee will not have the committee count against them for purposes of the cap on how many committees they can, can serve on. Again, you've been on the Oversight Committee uh, five, uh, five terms. Strikes me that a job of this uh, magnitude uh, doesn't need to be somebody's uh, part-time job in the afternoon. It needs to be somebody's full-time responsibility. This, is, this says in the resolution itself that it will not be a full-time responsibility. In fact, you shall keep all of the other responsibilities you have in Congress, and this shall just be an, an add-on. Um, those other uh, in, in, uh, oversight uh, institutions that, uh, that you uh, referenced, are any of those focused solely on, uh, on, on this uh, oversight? Do you know? Do not know, uh, uh, Mr. Woodall. Um, look, I think, I think you've, it's been said by you and the ranking member, um, we're talking about not two trillion, we're talking about three trillion dollars here already. Three trillion, we, we do need oversight. I don't fear oversight as one of your colleagues said earlier. I, I'm, I mean, the vast majority of what I spend my time doing on behalf of the citizens in the fourth district of Ohio and for the taxpayers of this country is oversight. I want oversight. I just know we have eight different entities working on oversight as we all speak who can do this, but some, for some reason, the Democrats won a ninth, and they've already named, before the CARES Act even passed, which created the commission, the speaker had already announced he was going to create a select committee and put the Democrats' nominee for president, or the likely nominee for president, put their number, his number one supporter as the chairman of that committee. That strikes me as political. Now, I don't, I don't think it takes a genius to see that, so that's my concern. Let's let these eight other entities who are already doing the work for the American taxpayer, let's let them do their job, because we need oversight of a package this big Overall spending now is after, after this bill passes tomorrow and the president signs it, we're talking $3 trillion of Americans' hard-earned tax money. I definitely want oversight. I don't want something political, though. The, Mr. Chairman, it's not, uh, it's, it's not fair to ask Mr. Jordan to, to, uh, to answer for this, uh, uh, for this language, but I do think it's worth uh, getting those, those answers. Is it better to have this as a select committee, uh, a subcommittee, as opposed to a, to a full committee? I don't know why that decision has been made, but I think it's worth talking about why isn't this committee, if it's important enough to create, important enough to act on legislation and mark up legislation that's been specifically prohibited, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure uh, why uh, this is an, an add-on uh, for members so they keep all of their other assignments and then do this as a, as a part-time uh, uh, evening job. But why haven't we uh, taken folks uh, as, as, uh, 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 as, as we have an opportunity to do and, and, and focus them on something again, to, to Ms. Torres's point, a, a gargantuan undertaking uh, to 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 track these uh, dollars and, and make sure that, that they are accountable in the way that that we would like for them to. I I think of this uh, effort, this oversight effort that, uh, as, as Mr. Jordan is here to oppose the creation of the the subcommittee, but demand uh, that uh, that oversight be vigorous uh, and uh, and and aggressive. Uh, it, it strikes me, as, as, uh, as my friend Alcy Hastings would say, passing strange uh, that uh, this bipartisan goal that we have uh, to do this oversight, that we could not have moved forward in a, in a bipartisan uh, way. And, and given that this may be the only hearing, uh, the only conversation that members have uh, on this uh, at the committee uh, level, I, I 
put that uh, uh, to you for your, uh, for your uh, consideration. And Mr. Jordan, again, I, I, I thank you for, for coming and, and being our, our, our sole uh, jurisdictional uh, expert uh, here. I yield back. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, I, I guess in answer to the gentleman's question, I think uh, the way we're approaching this means we can get it up running more quickly uh, and more effectively and efficiently. But let me just say one thing uh, as to why we need uh, all the oversight necessary. I want to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record uh, an article from NBC News, uh, Trump pushes back against congressional oversight for 500 billion bailout fund. Uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record an article from Politico, Trump removes independent watchdog for coronavirus funds upending oversight panel. I'd like to also ask unanimous consent to put in the record a, uh, an article from Vox. Trump says he won't comply with key transparency measures uh, in the coronavirus uh, bill. Uh, and uh, just so that um, you know, my friends don't uh, say this is the press taking the president's st uh, statements out of context, I also want to insert in the record the statement of the, by the president, his signing statement uh, on the CARES Act, in which he makes it explicitly clear uh, that he wants to undermine the key uh, a component of oversight of this stuff. Look, this is a, uh, you know, uh, we can, this is an interesting conversation about can you be, do you have to be on the oversight committee to be on the select committee or can you be on another committee? That's all fine and nice, but I will tell you to the average person who's, who's watching or who's following this, I mean, what they care about is the fact that trillions of dollars, their hard earned dollars that have been uh, appropriated to help alleviate the suffering uh, that this, pandemic has caused to deal with saving our economy, they want to make sure that it is going uh, to where it's supposed to go and being spent properly. I mean, that's what this is all about, and we can have these other arguments, but uh, I think that's what we need to focus. Mr. 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 Perlmutter. Can I ask my friend from Colorado to yield just one moment? Sure. I, I just don't want uh, that to be the final word, Mr. Chairman. No. There's not a, I don't believe there's going to be a person on the dais or a person uh, in at the witness table or in the audience who opposes the vigorous oversight that you have just uh, listed. Each one of those articles that you asked to have entered into the record, I support having each one of those investigated. Good. Well, it's, it's the question of whether I don't know it's... Why, 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 why this is so controversial. Then. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll yeah. tell you. Your, your, your goal is to be efficient and effective. And my question is, why is standing up a brand new subcommittee more efficient than using the one we already have? Why is standing up a brand new investigatory. I appreciate the gentleman's question. I will reclaim my time. I thank my friend from Colorado. Uh, a couple, I want to address a couple, three things. Um, first, I want to address the fact that the chairman is wearing a mask with the New England Patriots on it and uh, really kind of gets, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> and uh, so I want to start with that. So not serious, but two serious <laughs> subjects. First one is um, the need for some type of remote voting or proxy voting here. In a moment when the country is in the midst of a pandemic, which requires quarantining many individuals, places a couple of the members of this committee at risk were they to be here today. And it's disappointing that we aren't addressing that today with us all here. And so I would urge my chairman and my ranking member to act on this as quickly as possible, to address it in a way that covers the current pandemic and future pandemics, and not to just limit it to this moment today, so that some future Congress can continue to operate in a setting like we're in. So it's, it's an important issue. I know our leadership is looking at it, and I ask them to at, look at it ASAP. Now, the third point I want to address, Mr. Jordan and I were elected at the same time. We've been friends for a long time. We agree on a few th things. We disagree on a lot of things. And I couldn't disagree with you more today, my friend, uh, because in this instance, we know, I mean, the facts are just so overwhelming. I don't care if you have 100 oversight committees. They're not going to be able to match 
what we face today. We're looking at tens of thousands of people dead from this virus, multiples of that hospitalized, and hundreds of thousands of people today infected. We cannot even, we haven't gotten our arms around how much the losses are that we're sustaining every day and will for some time, and the different kinds of things that are going to be needed to address it. We've invested big sums of money, which in my opinion are nothing compared to the losses we've sustained as a nation and, and across the globe. We need to have oversight that look at our health care systems, our businesses, our people. You know, who gets the assistance, when they get it, where they get it, why they get it, how they get it. And, you know, I was going to get chippy and talk about Benghazi and the Oversight Committee and the length of time and the, all of the things that you all went into that I thought were um, misguided, but I'm not going there. I want to, and this mask is difficult because I must uh, not wear it properly, but to take issue with Mr. Clyburn as the leader of this, as the chair, and to say only that it's political, I would just disagree to the nth degree with my friend, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Jim Clyburn has been a leader in this Congress for decades. Somebody who we all respect, somebody who we all trust his intellect and his ability to articulate things. And to the degree he ends up taking a position in some fashion or another on your oversight committee, I would say that only helps your oversight committee. So this committee is going to be essential, just as all the others are. This is so big. I wish it weren't so big, but it is bigger than anything you and I have ever had to contend with. And so with that, I just, I appreciate the gentleman's respond? comments. Certainly, you may respond. Well, I, I, I respect Mr. Clyburn as well and his service to our country over the years, but um, I also respect Congresswoman Shalala, and she has been tasked, been, been picked by the Speaker for a commission that's designed all, already in the, the act we all voted on to look at this issue. So I've said several times now, we have eight different entities looking at this. Why the ninth? Well, Why the ninth? And, 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 and I would the ninth, reclaim, do we need reclaiming a tenth? my time. Do we need a Reclaiming my time. I said we could have a hundred, all of them working well in a coordinated fashion, and they still don't match what we're facing today, Mr. Jordan. That's the difference. And I think to have this committee with the talent of a former HHS secretary, the talent of a leader like Jim Clyburn, who all of us recognize as a leader, is the least that we can do as members of Congress for the people we represent. And with that, I yield back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Burgess, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, and, and uh, my friend, welcome to the Rules Committee, reconstituted in a different location. Um, I never aspired to be on the Ways and Means Committee, but it's, uh, I can see why they like this room so much. It's, it's, it's really very, uh, very well appointed. Was there, did you want to finish a thought that you were uh, trying to articulate uh, with the gentleman from Colorado? I mean, no, I mean, I've, I've said it several times. Uh, I think it's obvious why we have the ninth entity to look into it. I think the seventh different committee to look into this issue um, is not about the oversight that we desperately need uh, to have for every program, every agency that, you know, is, is part of our government. We, we need it for, that's why we have the oversight committee. That's why we have subcommittees of every single uh, standing committee to look at oversight of the various agencies, not just with this, this huge crisis we're in now, but with everything. Um, this, I think people see it for what it is. And, made that point several times. Well, you know, it's, <clears throat> I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee as part of my day job, and we do have a, an oversight investigation yep. subcommittee. Um, and I just think of the phenomenal opportunity we had real time 
real time to look at, well, we just passed a big bill, partly last Congress, finally got across the finish line this Congress, called the Pandem Pandemic All Hazard Preparedness Act. Big bill, president signed it uh, in a signing ceremony in June of 2019, so six months before this crisis. So as this thing started to evolve, I couldn't get anyone in our subcommittee interested in the majority to have a hearing, a real-time oversight hearing. We just did a big bill. We just did a big bill, but it had a lot of money in it. Did we get it right? And now we've got a real-time test going on. It would have been a perfect opportunity to look at things like the strategic national stockpile. It would have been a perfect time to look at the role of the ASPR in, in uh, coordinating the response, and we didn't do it. It would have been a perfect time to talk about the testing because by the middle of February, there were some problems that were emerging. And as February wore on and got into March, it was more and more apparent. Why not do an oversight hearing? Why not ask the CDC to come in? In fact, your committee, your committee did. You had two days of hearings. But the Energy and Commerce Committee, you know what we did? We had a hearing on ticket scalping. We had a ticket on, uh, a hearing on, on flavored tobacco. We had a hearing on uh, horse racing. We didn't see the necessity of this thing that was staring us in the face. You, at least, in, in your oversight and government reform committee, had the had the foresight to have two days of what I saw on the replays on C-SPAN later in the evening were, were pretty intense and, and involved hearings. So certainly thank your committee for, for doing that work. Our subcommittee could have done more, and I wish we had. I, I don't think uh, history will look kindly on the fact that the number one technology and health committee in the United States Congress couldn't be couldn't see its way to do any, any real-time oversight of a problem that was occurring. But I'll tell you what bothers me about this more than anything else. If I understand correctly, Mr. Jordan, the, the makeup of this committee will not be, it'll be 12 members, right? And it'll be a 7-5 division, not a 6-6 division. Speaker appoints the chairman. Chairman has outsized power for the committee. You know, I remember this happening in uh, 2009. And there was a lot of discussion about, we, are, we need the new PCORA Commission to investigate the great causes of the Great Recession. So just like in the 1930s when they investigated the, the, the banking deals that brought down the economy, let's have a new PCORA Commission. But it was a 7-5 division. And nobody remembers what that select committee came up with because it was a harshly partisan divide and as a consequence, they really didn't accomplish anything. If this were a serious effort, then make it a 50-50 proposition and let the chairmanship duties be shared by uh, the top Republican and the top Democrat. If you were serious about getting to the bottom of it, I think that's what you would do. If your idea was to have a a political theater, then you do exactly what's outlined to us here today. So I, I think, well, I can't really add much more than the, the riveting cross-examination from the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall, as usually did a, a, did a masterful job. But again, this, this committee does not add anything to the volume of oversight that is already available to us as members of the United States House of Representatives. And you've articulated it very well. We have that capability already to add another harshly partisan committee that is going to come up with a conclusion that will, yeah, it'll be good for the news cycle, but I don't think it's going to be helpful for anyone who wants to go back and historically look at this and learn the lessons, because certainly we didn't seem interested at the time uh, to make that judgment as to whether or not we've learned the lessons. I'll, I'll be happy to yield to the well, gentleman. I appreciate the, I think you're right on target. I wish that the, subcommittees of the various standing committees, Energy and Commerce, Ways and Means, uh, Financial Services, Small Business uh, Committee. I wish those appropriate oversight committees were here meeting now, along with the full oversight committee, doing the oversight we're supposed to do, exercising the appropriate social distancing, doing our job. For goodness sake, there are all kinds of people who've been working the entire past six weeks 
doing important, the first responders, the truckers hauling the food, the process, everyone else work doing their job. We, we can obviously meet and do our job. We're doing it as we speak. We're doing it right here in this committee. So those oversight committees should be here looking at all this. That's fine. And as you said, we had two days of hearings in the oversight committee before we took this, this long break. So that's what we should be doing, but that's not what this is. We know that's not what this is. Eight different committees looking at all this already, but no, we need a ninth because the ninth is going to be political. The ninth is going to focus on, we know what it's going to focus on. And I think the American people know it as well. I appreciate the gentleman being here. I appreciate his testimony. I'll yield back my time. I, I thank the gentleman, but uh, I just want to stay for the record. I hate to break it to him, but the last time I checked, there were more Democrats in the House than there are Republicans. Uh, and I think our Republican colleagues on the Select Committee will be happy that their ratio is not like ours on the Rules Committee. Um, but I, uh, either way, I hope that they work as well as we do, uh, working together to try to advance uh, the critical role of the Select Committee. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested, I was interested in the gentleman's comments that if, if you want to create a Select Committee that is not political theater, that it has to be equally divided. Is the gentleman now saying that the Benghazi Commission uh, was political theater? Um, I think if I remember correctly, that was a 7-5 split uh, in favor of the Republicans. So. Uh, I just point that out for the record. Uh, would, would the gentleman, would the chairman to, yield? I'm happy to yield to the gentleman from uh, Georgia. Your, your point is well taken, though more recently, uh, when uh, Speaker, uh, Repu last Republican Speaker of the House created a select committee uh, on the budget and on labor, it was in fact an equally divided Republican and Democratic uh, committee, even though Republicans had a vast majority. And when Speaker Pelosi came to work, and decided to, to uh, uh, this Congress to create a select committee on the modernization of Congress. She too constituted that committee an equal Repub number of Republicans and Democrats. So our, we, our we more did, recent I, no, history I, I, is when I, speakers I, are trying to do no, serious no. work, they they very much do divide it on a, on an equal basis. I, I thank I, my chair. Actually, Chairman. the Rules Committee actually helped create the select the special committee on modernization. So we, um, but uh, no, I just point that out. I, I, I find all you know this. Um, some of this commentary just uh, a little bit surprising. Uh, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I get to my substantive remarks, I just do have a point of order I wanted to raise with you. I, I haven't read the, uh, the textual rules or guidance from the Capitol physician, but I understood you to say that he was recommending that all members wear masks. Is that just members of the committee or does it include witnesses and other members who attend? Yeah, so I, th I think the guidance is that he recommends us to wear a mask. We're not required to, um, but uh, we're recommended to do so for the safety of those around us. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, but it's, it's not a, an, an absolute requirement. Okay. Um, I'll just say uh, I've seen... And if I'm wrong, doctor, raise your hands. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, I've seen... Uh, spokespeople for the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the President's science advisors, saying that masks were recommended at, at public meetings. And so uh, it's obviously not, and I heard a nurse emphasizing this on TV, it's obviously not a sign of bravery not to wear a mask. It's a sign of irresponsibility towards other people, because when we wear a mask, we're protecting them. When they don't wear a mask, they're not protecting us. So I'll just leave it at that. Mr. Chairman, we meet at an extraordinary moment in the history of the United States of America. Today, there are now 846,982 diagnosed cases of COVID-19. We have lost 46,609 of our people, although that number is almost certainly an undercount because in so many states, people are not counted if they died at home and were not tested. Um, that's around 15 times the number of people we lost on 9-11. Uh, it's getting up to the number of people we lost in the entire Vietnam War. President, of course, promised us, you know, this was one guy from China, or it's a, a hoax coming from the other party, fake news, democratic plot, uh, so on, all, all of the nonsense that cost us precious weeks and months in trying to organize and mobilize the country to deal with this pandemic. So now, here we are, a couple trillion dollars later, that we're paying for 
the folly and the recklessness of people at the highest levels of government in order to throw an economic lifeline to our people, millions of whom have been thrown out of work, millions of whose businesses are teetering on the edge of collapse, and we're spending trillions of dollars to try to rescue the country's public health system and the hospitals. And so, the common sense suggestion comes forward, let's set up a committee to try to follow the trillions of dollars so it's not used as a money-making operation by an administration that has tried to forestall every form of oversight this Congress has tried to exercise from the very beginning of the administration. And you'll recall it was not long ago that the President of the United States ordered his administration categorically not to cooperate with investigative requests of the committees of Congress, categorically not to participate in subpoenas, categorically to reject congressional oversight. And I would so love to hear how my friends would have reacted if President Obama had brought our country to its knees economically, in public health, and constitutionally the way this president has. Can you imagine what they'd be saying if we were wearing masks up here under President Obama? Mr. Chairman, I cannot accept the counterfeit outrage of people upset about the fact that we're creating a committee to conduct oversight over the trillions of dollars of the taxpayers' money that's going out the door to try to clean up after the messes created by the government. I can't accept that counterfeit outrage. Mr. Jordan, do you know how many investigations were launched in Congress into the 2012 Benghazi attack? I served on the Select Committee, and I will tell you what, that you know, was do you know how, was I'm asking you a different question. It was formed two and a half years after the reclaiming tragedy Reclaiming my time. Mr. Not Chairman, before reclaiming the my CARES time. Act even You passed. might not be wearing a mask, but you adhere to the rules of this committee while you're here, Mr. Jordan, okay? I'm following the rules. Okay, yes, and I'm telling you, I'm reclaiming my time. Six feet social distancing. I'm reclaiming you know, my time. In. That's why I walked around this way, because of the court reporter. Okay. I'm following Mr. the rules. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm reclaiming my time. For the sake of our stenographer, we can't be speaking over each other, and so... Uh, okay, I'm going to answer the question... The Maryland is controlling the time. The question I posed was how many investigations were there? Mr. Jordan was upset that he thinks there may be eight investigations into the money that we're spending to deal with uh, the pandemic. Not you maybe, see, there the, are. The, there the, are eight. Excuse me, the time is mine, Mr. Jordan. We're not in the Benghazi committee right now. We're in the Rules Committee. The chairman's right over there. There were 10 investigations conducted, 10 investigations conducted in the 2012 Benghazi attack, six of them by Republican-controlled House committees, five House committees, Armed Services, Foreign Affairs, Intelligence, Judiciary, Oversight, and Government Reform. Then the Select Committee investigation was formed. Mr. Jordan served on the, on the uh, Benghazi Select Committee. It cost more than six million dollars over two and a half years. It was disbanded at the end of the 114th Congress. And guess what? They found that Hillary Clinton, they could not find anything wrong that Hillary Clinton had oh, done. It right. led to no prosecutions at all, millions of dollars later. But in any event, let me ask you, so we, we, we get the counterfeit outrage that there might be Eight, God forbid, nine committees that could do investigations into the trillions of dollars we're spending to clean up the mess of the government of the United States. And there were 10 investigations into Benghazi. Now think about that. Mr. Chairman, this president doesn't want any oversight at all. You know, after we passed the CARES Act to set up the unemployment insurance system, and I am so proud that we're getting an extra $600 a week to our people who've been thrown out of work through no fault of their own. And we've extended by 13 weeks unemployment benefits despite the fact that they fought us every way. Every step along the way there, we got that done. And we got the hundreds of billions of dollars for small businesses, and I'm proud of that. And we got all that done, and there was a signing ceremony that the president had because the president signed into law. And he took that occasion to try to reject the principle that there would be an inspector general put in the Treasury Department to oversee the money given away 
to the big industries because they, they regarded that as their personal slush fund. They wanted hundreds of billions of dollars that they could give away. The president actually offered that he would do his own oversight. He said he would do the oversight over that money himself. That, that was the argument he made. And he rejects the idea that we have a congressional oversight panel that the inspector general has got to report to. Come on, get serious, be real. This is not a money-making operation to see how much money you can get away with for you and your friends. That's not what this is. This is money to rescue the American economy and rescue the American people. And of course we should have oversight. We should be proud to have oversight over it. And we'll, so why would they politicize this? It strikes me as the most basic thing in the world that we would have oversight. Well, I don't know. To my mind, it seems like a distraction from the fact, Mr. Chairman, that the president has no plan to get the country out of this. No plan at all. I waited with bated breath last Thursday. The president said he was coming out with his plan to reopen America. I said, hallelujah, I can't wait to see it. What's the president's plan? You know what the president's plan was? It was a bunch of flabby advisory recommendations sent out to the states saying, check these out. Maybe you could think about it. Nothing in that plan about the role of the federal government. Nothing in that plan about how to mobilize the industry of the United States to build the PPEs that we're sorely lacking in. Nothing about building the ventilators that American citizens need to live. Nothing about that. Nothing about mobilizing the greatest scientists in the world to get together to create a plan for America to get, a, get out of this. And nothing about national guidelines that we can use to organize the states so you don't have some state governor saying, oh, there's nothing wrong, there's no problem, we don't even have social distancing rules. In the meantime, we've got other states that are grouping together like we're in the Articles of Confederation in the Northeast in the Midwest and California are saying, the federal government's not doing anything to help us. We're going to have to try to create our own little coalitions of states. We need a plan in the national government to get us out of this nightmare. We need a plan. The president's offered us no plan. I'm happy that the state governors, like my governor Hogan, who's a Republican and a capable leader, has been offering. I'm glad about the leadership being offered by Governor Cuomo in New York and the governor of California, but you know what? They're all saying they can't do it without the federal government. So that's what we should be focused on, a plan, instead of whining about the fact that we're gonna have an oversight committee to detect fraud, waste, abuse, and corruption in the distribution of trillions of dollars of our money. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Lesko. Uh... Thank you. Um, this year has been a crazy year. Can I tell you that? Uh, I sat in this committee, along with Jim Jordan and several of you on the opposite side of the aisle, when we were doing impeachment. That was the last crazy thing that happened in this committee room. And geez, uh, I wonder, uh, Mr. Jordan, do you think this select subcommittee is going to investigate what Democrats were doing while President Trump was banning flights from China? Maybe, maybe it was impeachment. What do you think? I doubt if they look into that. My guess is um, that that committee, the Democrats in that committee, will be talking a lot like Mr. Raskin did, ranting and raving and going after the President of the United States, who, as you pointed out, when he did suspend travel from China, Democrats, the mainstream press, all complained about it, criticized him for it, but in hindsight, it was a great move. So I, my guess is you're going to get more of this, and if I could, we've had three Democrats now mention the Benghazi, Select Committee, which I was on, which was formed two and a half years, two and a half years after the tragedy took place that night, September 11, 2012, after the Secretary of State refused to even nominate someone for the Inspector General's position at the State Department. The Obama administration didn't have an Inspector General. After the Secretary of State told the American people told the American people that it was a video that caused it when the day after we had the transcript she did with the Egyptian prime minister where she said, we know the film had nothing to do with it. It was a planned attack, not a protest. Two and a half years after we learned the Secretary of State destroyed 30,000 emails, and you guys want to bring that up as a comparison? You've got to be kidding me. 
Two and a half years after the Attorney General Holder did, did nothing to look into it, unlike Mr. Barr, who's already doing things, unlike the FTC, it's already doing things we learned today on the Judiciary Committee, and you guys want to bring up Benghazi. I didn't bring it up, you guys did. I wasn't going to say anything until you started, until Mr. Raskin and the Chairman and Mr. Perlman brought it up. So we got eight entities looking at this right now, but we got to have a ninth because the ninth's going to do just what our colleague Mr. Raskin did criticize the president. We know, what, we know what's going to happen. There are going to be hearings in an election year, this, this election year, this summer, where we have speeches just like our good colleague and friend from Maryland just gave. That's what we're going to have. And we all know it. And we can pretend that's not what it's going to be, but the American people understand what's happening here. Well, Mr. Jordan, I, I think you're right. And, and Mr. Raskin, you're allegation of counterfeit outrage and the rhetoric that you gave just proves our point. It proves what we think is going to happen about this committee. And the only purpose that I believe for this extra oversight committee is another way, another venue to criticize the President of the United States. I mean, ever since January of 2019, I serve on three different committees, uh, Rules Committee, Homeland Security Committee, and Judiciary Committee. And in all of the committees, although Rules, I have to say, has been the most civil, it seems like there's a concerted effort by my Democratic colleagues, must be coming down from their leadership is my guess, that the whole purpose of this whole, all of 2019 and into 2020 when the impeachment was to criticize the President of the United States. It starts out with every, you know, t the people they bring forward in the committees and they accuse the Customs and Border Protection officers of child abuse and negligent homicide. And I mean, it's just over the top. And you get, you know, some people at home, including my husband, go, how can you sit through this? How can you sit through this and listen to this rhetoric over and over again? And, you know, sometimes it's really hard. I have to admit, it's really hard. And you may think I'm doing rhetoric, but I'm not saying outlandish things like, like I just heard. I mean, Mr. Raskin, I hope you see, maybe you don't, that what you just did, all this rhetoric, all this complaining, criticizing the president, is exactly what we believe the whole purpose of this subcommittee is. And you're just proving the point. Um, Mr. Jordan, do you have anything else you would like to add? I mean, no. I, thought, I mean, we referenced the cost of the Benghazi Select Committee. My, my guess is the Mueller special counsel investigation, with came, which came back and said no collusion, no conspiracy, no coordination, $30 million, 19, 19 lawyers, all kinds of subpoenas, all kinds of, all kinds of taxpayer resources. I, I think that's a comparison that's worth noting as well. Um, look, let's do the oversight we're supposed to do. I wish every single committee would meet, meet just like we are here. This room should be booked every day maybe. Committee's coming in doing the oversight. I'm, I'm fine with that. Mr. Woodall said, I've been on the Oversight Committee for a long time. I'm fine with that. We should do it in the Oversight Committee. We should do it. Why is the Oversight Committee meeting right now looking at the World Health Organization? For goodness sake. We give American taxpayer dollars and they lie to us. My, our, our colleague from Texas said it best. We don't have to give organizations money to lie to us. They'll probably do it for free. So why don't have them in here where we can add, bring, bring people in? We got Americans in context there. Bring, bring them in to have those kind of hearings. Have the subcommittees of energy and commerce, ways and means, small business, financial services. Have them meet, do the oversight. I'm fine with that. I want all that. I think that's important. Everyone does. What we don't want is another political committee using taxpayer dollars to attack the person that 63 million Americans voted for and the Democrats tried to impeach just a few months ago. And that impeachment effort probably impeded our effort to deal with this virus we find ourselves confronting right now. And Mr. Jordan, I have one last question. On here, it looks like we're authorizing another $2 million uh, in expenses for this subcommittee. 
um, when we already have other order. I, you know, I don't know how much this costs. Do you think that it's possible that um, they're going to hire outside attorneys like they did with the Judiciary Committee? With, I mean, is that a normal amount of money? I don't know. You've been on government. I mean, I, I, look, I, I haven't even read the whole bill yet because we, we got it 15 minutes before we walked in. I was working on our comments, so I'm, I'm looking through it. There, there are sections that, that stand out to me, executive branch, internal, external communications related to the different things it says in, in here. Who knows? What I know is what's happened for the past three and a half years. What I know is what happened prior to the president even being elected when the FBI spied on two people associated with this campaign. And we know that they misled the FISA court because we've had the Inspector General, the Inspector General issued a report that told us that took place, confirmed everything we suspected. The only thing that, the only thing that we had wrong, those of us who've been looking at this issue for several years, the only thing we had wrong was it was worse than we thought, uh, based on what Inspector General Horowitz has now informed the Congress and the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. And just um, to kind of put the cost in perspective, uh, uh, do you know what the per what percentage two million is from two trillion? It's that's point zero 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 one percent. One million seconds equals eleven and a half days. One trillion seconds equals thirty two thousand years. That's the difference we are talking about between a million and a trillion. And we are spending uh, two million dollars to oversee two trillion dollars. And I don't think that that's an extreme proposal. Um, and um, and I, 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 I don't want to get off the topic here. Uh, but uh, I would now like to yield to the uh, gentlewoman from uh, Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you very much. Um, I, first, I want to thank our colleagues and the staff who have heeded the recommendations of scientists and doctors that we socially distance, that we wear masks, because it's the responsible thing to do. And so I appreciate everyone who has, including our spiritual and medical leadership here in the House. Um, I think what we're trying to do here, again, by setting up a select committee to supervise spending $3 trillion is also the responsible thing to do. Um, it, it just seems insane to me that we wouldn't do that. And guess what? It seems insane to my constituents, too, because just today, <coughs> Donna Culp said, you know, it'd be nice to see the relief money going to small businesses this time. We need real oversight. John DeMassi wants to know why large banks have skimmed billions in fees from the small business loans that we tried to set up here. Sue Packard wants to know why millions have gone to large corporations instead of small local businesses who can't even get an appointment with their local bank. Our disability community wants to know why parents of children with disabilities were given 36 hours to make known the fact that their children exist. And if they don't get that information in, if they didn't get that information into the IRS today, they have to wait for their stimulus check until 2021. So our constituents have a lot of questions about where the hell this $3 billion is going and why it isn't coming into their pockets. I live in Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania. The three counties that I represent have over 16,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus. We have lost 718 lives that we know of in the three counties that I represent. I mean, I don't know what Mr. Jordan's been doing for six weeks, but I sure as hell haven't been sitting around waiting to come back. I haven't to either. See. All right, so we can do work when we're not here. I know my caucus has been meeting regularly, and I've been meeting regularly with our state and local officials and the hospitals in my community and the small businesses in my community. So, you know, this nonsense about not being able to work remotely, that's just crazy. And I share with Mr. Perlmutter my frustration that we are not addressing the need to have some kind of emergency um, remote voting possibility so we can be responsible, so we can take care of our families so we can take care of our members who can't be here because they have pre-existing conditions. So I don't have to come from a state that is shut down because of the spike in coronavirus to a city that is shut down for the same reason, because that is not responsible. So I do think the Select Committee is the responsible thing to do. And with that, I would yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Ms. Chair. I'll, I'll be very brief. I think, while well, I'm certainly going to support uh, 
this resolution. Uh, one of the things that I find incredibly frustrating watching from uh, my uh, home office in Arundacoit, New York, is the continued uh, practice of the administration, which I hope will be an anomalous administration in the course of human history or American history, um, an administration that essentially feels as though it has no one to answer to, that doesn't believe in the oversight of the Congressional uh, uh, Article I of the, uh, of the Constitution and the powers of oversight, which have been one of the hallmarks of the Congress since its inception. And what frustrates me is the complete desire to ignore the proper role of Congress and the oversight of uh, dollars uh, that American taxpayers pay for. I, I wish I could say I thought uh, 100 subcommittees or select committees could do the job, or one. My fear is that no matter what we do, the administration will continue to block any desire by the Congress or the American public to uh, make sure that there is an accounting of what we do. And you see this on a daily basis. Uh, but, you know, I think we're all very, very frustrated with it. Um, so I'll continue to support this. But I will say this. When the respect for the rule of law, when respect for the Constitution, when respect for the things that we have all agreed for centuries is the uh, providence of, the, uh, of the, the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate, when that goes away, we essentially have nothing. I often say to people that when I take a $5 bill out of my pocket, if I happen to have one, uh, there's an agreement among all of us as to what that $5 can purchase, $5 worth of goods and services. Truth is, it's a piece of paper. It's not probably worth $5, uh, but we all agree. That's our common agreement. Uh, that's how the world works. And we have to have rules and laws to abide by, or else there's nothing. And the decision by the President to continually undermine the role of the Congress in oversight, the role of the Congress in doing its constitutional obligations and its uh, responsibilities is uh, very, very frustrating. I, I appreciate the witness. I appreciate uh, his intentions, which I assume are good. Um, I appreciate uh, his uh, passion about this, but what I fail to see uh, working is people concerned not with whether it's a Republican or whether it's a Democrat, whether or not it's someone you agree with or disagree with, but an agreement by all of us that the uh, Article I obligations and responsibilities and duties of the Congress must be upheld because the next president, Mr. Jordan, may not agree with. And if, um, if the next president takes the same view that this president does, that he is above the law and doesn't have to respond to the Congress or doesn't have to respond to inspector generals in his own administration or doesn't have to get anybody confirmed by the United States Senate because everyone in the administration is acting, uh, then if the next president takes that view, we will all have to answer for it. The American public ultimately will have to answer for it, and we will be left with nothing. The Constitution is simply a piece of paper if we don't all agree to support it and, and all agree that Article I powers have real meaning, have real teeth, and are there to protect the interests of the American public. So I'll support this, and I just I, I pray that somehow, somewhere on uh, the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, there will be a glimmer of understanding of what the framers meant when they put these powers, oversight, responsibilities in the hands of the United States Congress. With that, I'll yield back. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can I just a quick comment? Sure. This administration, this president, his White House counsel testified for over 30, his White House counsel testified for over 30 hours in front of the special counsel. His son testified for over 20 hours in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee. I don't, I mean, this idea that they're not cooperating, not, not, not allowing, we had the whole Mueller investigation where those things took place. And I forget how many years and how much money and everything else, but it was over $30 million. It was 22 months. It was 19 lawyers. So to, to I just I appreciate the gentleman's comments on the need for the Congress to do oversight. 100% in favor of that but I disagree strongly with his assessment of this administration. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I didn't want to get into this Mueller stuff right now because we're focused on something else, but I would just remind you that uh, there are a number of people that have been convicted, and some of them have gone to jail uh, for their crimes. And um, I also point out to people who denied Russia's involvement in our 2016 election that I point you to the, to the bipartisan uh, report that just came out of the Senate uh, 
uh, Intelligence That's Committee, true. which I think is pretty powerful. I want to yield now, uh, last but not least, to our, well, I don't want to say our newest member, but our, because <laughs> she's been here, yeah, our returning member, uh, Congresswoman Doris Matsui of California. No. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. While I'm honored to be here tonight in this new temporary role, my hope is that my cherished friend and colleague, uh, Mark Desagne, will make a full recovery and resume his duties on this uh, committee very soon. Um, you know, on a bipartisan basis, Congress has provided more than $2 trillion in emergency relief. We all supported this. This desperately needed funding will help keep families safe, frontline workers healthy, and small businesses operating. But this money is only effective if it's administrated quickly and in line with congressional intent. And that's why we are here today to establish the select subcommittee on the coronavirus crisis. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been getting calls constantly, you know, conference calls, singular calls, getting questions from people in my district every single day. It's filled with that, from small business people, from hospital people, from community health centers, all the frontline workers. They really want to know why they are not getting their share of this relief money. They're asking constantly about why the big businesses that they understand are big businesses because they work in a small business world have been getting the relief. A lot of our hospitals are saying they're not having the PPEs. The community health centers are constantly calling me also. They want to know how to protect their loved ones as they go to the hospitals and come, try to come back to their homes. That's why this is really very, very necessary. Like the Truman Committee Commission, which was created to oversee dollars spent during World War II, this select committee will help us to better understand our federal response to this pandemic and will safeguard taxpayer dollars against waste, waste, fraud, and abuse. And you know, it will also help us identify how we can best support our next efforts as we move forward to help our communities. You know, this does not at all seem to me to be controversial, and I urge my colleagues to support this resolution, and I yield back. Thank you very much. I think everybody has asked questions, uh, so I think there are no other questions uh, for this witness. Uh, if you have anything you want to leave uh, to be in, in writing, to be in sort of the record, please do so. Thank you, so, Mr. Chairman. Always great to see you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for being here. You you Thanks for having us. Go. Uh, are there any other witnesses? Uh, seeing none, um, uh, where are we now here? Um, this closes the hearing. For, uh, and I will now uh, uh, recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Torres, for a uh, motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move the committee grant a rule that provides for the adoption of HRS 935, establishing a select committee on the coronavirus crisis as a select investigative subcommittee of the Committee on Oversight and Reform. Uh, you heard the motion from the gentleman from California. Is there any amendment or discussion? No? All right, hearing none, the vote is now on the motion uh, from the gentle lady from uh, California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Gentlemen, for, yeah, a roll call vote has been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hastings. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Mr. Morelli. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala. Ms. Shalala. Aye. Yes. How are you? Aye. Okay. Ms. Shalala. Aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Burgess? Mr. Burgess? No. Mrs. Lesko? Mrs. Lesko? No. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Clerk, report the total. Seven yeas, four nays. The motion is agreed to. Um, I will be handling for the uh, majority. And I will manage for the Republicans. I thank you. I thank everybody for being here um, and your flexibility. I thank the staff for being here. And uh, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.